Bismillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Friday Forum. Uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, uh, the Friday Forum is a weekly event uh, that, ha that's for, that happens every Friday night uh, for young adults where topics on current issues are discussed. Uh, tonight we're going to have a, a continuation of the discussion we had uh, a couple weeks on the topic of voting. Uh, but this time we're going to be discussing the religious duty to vote. Uh, as well as the consequences of elections. Uh, before we start, just a few announcements. Uh, alhamdulillah, we have a few programs that are starting up at the, at the masjid. Uh, tomorrow, we have our monthly community hub event here. It will be here at the masjid at 5 p.m., inshallah. There will be a lecture on, the par on parenting for the adults with Sheikh Usama and Ammu Fikri. And there will also be a lecture for the youth on how to go to Jannah through your parents with Ustad uh, Ibrahim Salman. Uh, there will be pizza and, and free babysitting, inshallah. We're also kicking off a new course here at the Masjid uh, on, the, on the basics of Islam with Sheikh Usama and Ammu Fikri. Uh, the course will be weekly on Saturdays, and the first session will be tomorrow at 6 p.m., inshallah. And it will be here at this Masjid. Um, we also have our, our Ulum Al Quran a class with Sheikh Usama. Uh, that class is happening uh, weekly uh, Sundays at 6 p.m and it's here as well. So as mentioned tonight, we will be discussing uh, the religious obligation to vote and the consequences of elections. Um, we have Ustad uh, Bakr Asaf here and we have Sister uh, Medina, uh, who is the government affairs manager at CARE, um, and they'll be here to lead the discussion. Uh, as always, we'd like to make this discussion interactive. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please use the uh, Slido link and inshallah, we'll try to um, address your question. Um, so with that, I think we're going to start with uh, Sister Medina. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Alhamdulillah, okay. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Good to see you again. I see some familiar faces, which is really, really good. And I see some new faces, which is also really, really good. So alhamdulillah. So tonight, we're here today to continue the Friday Forum um, series about elections and the importance of elections. So this is Friday Forum Part 2, and we're going to be discussing the religious obligation of civic engagement and the consequences of elections. So let's get into it. Bismillah. So as you know, for those um, who saw me last time, my name is Medina Piwadrago. I am the inaugural government affairs manager at the Council on American Islamic Relations, New Jersey chapter. But for those who are not aware and who are new, um, I am a Burkina Bay American, West African from Newark, New Jersey, um, alumni of New York University, where I got my master's in public administration and public and nonprofit management and policy. Um, and then I also got my um, Bachelor of Arts in sociology from the College of New Jersey. Um, and as CARE Government Affairs Manager, I handle their public policy, advocacy, and legislative portfolio. Um, and I essentially engage lawmakers. I um, help to push policy changes on the local and state and federal levels, mostly on the state level. Um, and I partake in coalition building, so I interact with different advocacy organizations. Um, and I also educate community members on the importance of civic engagement, which is what I'm doing today. So I'm really, really excited. So, I think it's always important to begin with a disclaimer. So, for those who aren't aware, um, CURE is a nonpartisan organization. So, what that means is that we can encourage community members to participate in like federal, state, and local elections um, and conduct voter registration as well as get out the vote drives. We can do trainings, we can issue briefings, we can do a lot of the different things that like inform you and give you information. However, we don't claim any favorability to one candidate over another or one political party over another. Um, we're just here to make sure that our community voices are heard. Um, it's very important to understand that, you know, the Muslim community is not a monolith. We have Muslims who lean left and we have Muslims who lean right. So we want to be respectful to all political ideologies. So this is a nonpartisan presentation and we are a nonpartisan organization. But if you do have any more um, questions regarding specifics um, pertaining to um, elections after this presentation, you can visit um, Care Nationals Muslim Vote um, website, which is the um, voter education platform. 
matter of fact. So today's agenda, what we will be discussing, so we're going to be discussing the consequences of elections, as well as the powers of the President of the United States, the powers of the Governor of New Jersey, the powers of the New Jersey Legislature, or the State Assembly and the State Senate. Um, we're going to be discussing the powers of mayors and councils um, on the you know, city, borough, town, and township level. Also, reasons to vote, reasons to participate in civic engagement, and we're going to do a nice little closing, and we're going to have questions at the end. So, let's get into the consequences of elections. So, why do elections matter? A lot of people, you know, have been disenchanted, disheartened by, you know, political activity in this country, and a lot of times people don't feel that they want to vote, or a lot of people don't, um, you know, feel very excited to vote. But elections have serious consequences, both positive and both negative. So, First, why are elections important? They shape the outcome of public policy matters. Now, whether that be on the environment, voting rights, healthcare, criminal justice, what have you, any issue that is of importance to you is going to be, you know, the outcome of elections. So it's very important that your voices are heard and that you are being able to elect the people who are going to influence and determine your political representation at the federal, state, and local levels. Also, if you do, you know, want to make sure that your, you know, interests are represented, you want to elect people who coincide with those interests. You want to elect people who have similar values and similar views as you. So voting and participating in elections is one way to do that. Also, election results can empower or marginalize communities, both on a local, national, and um, international scale. Um, who's in power determines not only domestic policy but also foreign policy. So if those are matters that also are of concern to you, you want to be very active in who that you are voting for who are going to be representing um, specific ideologies and specific policies. So let's get into the power of the President of the United States of America. I'm pretty sure everybody knows who the President is. Can I get a uh, raise of hands of People who know who the president is? Okay, good. That's very good news. I like to hear that. <laughs> so, for those who aren't aware, our president currently is Joseph Robinette Biden, or Joe Biden, or Joe R. Biden. He is the 46th president of this current United States of America. So, what is his powers? What can he do? So, as president of the United States, he is the head of state, and he is also the head of the government. What does that mean? So he is the all-powerful person in terms of the United States of America. So each state he is, you know, over as well as the entire government of the United States. He serves as the commander of chief of our armed forces, so our military. He can write checks pursuant to appropriation law. So he's essentially, you know, ahead of our, you know, budgeting process when it comes to, you know, making um, revenue decisions. He can sign bills into law. He can also decide to reject bills or resolutions that our Congress, you know, propose to come to his desk. He can grant executive clemency. So what does that mean? For those who are very passionate about criminal justice reform, he is able to grant pardons for criminal offenses that are done with in the United States in this section of impeachment. So if someone is currently, like, you know, incarcerated or something of that nature, he can essentially, you know, get them out of prison or forgive their crime or offense. Um, so that is a very powerful power to have. Next, he can nominate and appoint. So he can put people in positions of power, judges, ambassadors, you know, federal positions, a lot of people who are also making decisions at the, you know, federal levels, um, not just, you know, within his specific cabinet or within executive offices um, of, you know, uh, the presidency. He also gets to pick um, his vice president, um, which is also a very powerful position. He can choose to fill vacancies within Senate um, or the legislature when there is a recess. Um, he can give advice um, to Congress. You know, he stands in front of the nation for the State of the Union to talk about what the country is going through. He can, you know, um, get Congress together, which is the legislature on the federal level, or he can, um, you know, tell them that they have to close out. 
and he can also receive foreign dignitaries. So he can meet with the presidents of different countries in the world. So that's also a very cool power. Sorry. Next, he can also commission officers of the United States of America. He's responsible for a lot of different relationships that we have with foreign nations or, you know, nations that are outside um, of our, you know, domestic or national purview. He can issue executive orders and executive orders are very important. While they don't have the full force of like specific laws that are signed by the legislature or Congress, they are very powerful um, acts that, you know, he can put into place that can cover specific ranges of policy issues. He can enforce law, so if Congress makes laws, he can make sure that those laws are being followed, which is a very big deal. And he can make treaties. Um, so treaties can be made with various different um, countries. So, you know, um, that can make or break different relationships, that can strengthen relationships, that can put some countries in power, other countries at a disadvantage. So he has a lot of powers. So it's very important that you engage and you are making the attempt to elect, um, you know, and participate in the presidential elections because this is a person who's going to represent you on a federal level um, in our interests um, in the domestic and the foreign world. Now, powers of the U.S. Congress. And for those who are not aware, U.S. Congress is essentially the Senate. So the federal um, Senate as well as the House of Representatives. So there's two chambers in the federal Congress. And currently, we have various different leaders. So we're currently going to be entering into the 118th Congress. So last session was the 117th Congress. Every session is a new number. So we're currently entering into the 118th session, and we currently have a new Speaker of the House. You probably were more familiar with Nancy Pelosi, who was the former Speaker of the House, but we now have a new Speaker of the House, who is um, Kevin McCarthy, Congressman from California's 20th District. And we currently have a new minority leader who is Hakeem Jeffries from um, the 8th District of New York. In addition to that, the Senate also has leadership um, in their chamber. So currently the majority leader is still um, Senator Charles Schumer um, or Chuck Schumer more so. And he represents um, the District of New York. Um, and our minority leader is Senator Mitch McConnell or um, Michelle Addison McConnell from Kentucky. Um, for those who aren't aware, currently the Republican leadership is um, in the majority um, in the House of Representatives. That, why, that is why the Speaker of the House is currently Republican. And um, in the Senate, the Democrats are currently um, in the majority. So that's why the majority leader in the Senate is a Democrat. So again, not partisan presentation, but there's a reason for why specific representation um, is a specific way and specific leadership is a specific way in both chambers. So now let's talk about the New Jersey U.S. Senators. So each senator, um, there's two uh, for every state in the um, union. So currently for New Jersey, we have two senators. We have a junior senator and we have a senior senator. So our senior senator um, is um, Robert Menendez, more commonly known as Bob Menendez. And also our junior senator is Senator Cory Booker, um, both representatives of New Jersey on the federal level. So they are members of our federal delegation. In addition to that, we also have congresswomen and congressmen or um, representatives in the House of Representatives. So we have 12 in total. Um, the first three, we have District 1, District 2, and District 3. Representative um, Norcross, Representative Van Drew, Andy Kim. And some of these individuals might be your representatives. So if you see your representatives, definitely, you know, pay attention to who they are, get to know them, you know, reach out to their offices because they have a lot of power on the federal level to make a lot of changes for your congressional district in which you live in. So it's very important to know who your federal um, Congress people are and your federal senators and federal delegation members are. Next, we have our next three from the 4th, 5th, and 6th district, Representative Smith, Gottheimer, and Pallone. 
Again, some familiar faces for folks who are aware of their federal um, delegation members, but if you aren't, definitely make sure you know what your congressional district is because these people have a lot of power and control over, you know, the specific, you know, policies that impact the places in which you live. Our next members include Representative Kane, Menendez, and Pasquel. Pasquale is very familiar to a lot of people because he is um, very, um, you know, connected to the Patterson area. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people know who he is. Um, this is Bob Menendez's son, um, and this is a new um, uh, member of the House of Representatives um, who recently got um, elected as well as uh, Menendez's son. We also have another um, group, which is our last group, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th district. My representative is actually Donald Payne Jr. My congressional district is the 10th district. So it's very important to be able, when you see these names, you're able to pinpoint, okay, I know this person. This is who represents me, and I want to get familiar with their policies and how the things that they've done affects my family, affects my community, affects ICPC, um, and so forth. So um, these are some more representative congresswomen and congressmen. Now, let's talk about their powers. They also have their um, unique specific set of powers, very different from the President of the United States on the federal level. So they are members of the legislative branch, which constitutes the Senate and the House of Representatives, which makes up the United States um, Congress. Now, with them, they have the authority to create laws and to enact um, legislation. They also can declare war. The president cannot declare war. Only Congress can declare war. So that is a very huge power. Um, and the people who you vote for have the power to make peace or to make war. So that's very important. Um, they can also reject presidential appointments. So while the president can appoint and make um, suggestions as to who he wants to fill specific roles, they can reject that. Um, they also can investigate. Um, on specific matters um, as it pertains to corruption and things of that nature. Um, and in order for legislation to be passed, they have to be able to send it to the president and the, and the president has to sign it. But if the president refuses to assign um, legislation or laws, they can also have, um, they have the power to bypass that by making sure that if they vote, they can um, supersede his veto and make sure that a, a law still passes if they choose to take that route. So they do have a lot of powers and it's very important to know um, and to participate in these elections as well. well on top of that, um, there are 435 um, elected members um, throughout the nation who represent the House of Representatives. As I just told you, New Jersey has 12 out of that um, number. So um, definitely want to know who those individuals are. The um, representatives, we discussed the presiding officer of the House of Representatives is the Speaker of the House. Um, they are the third in line in succession to the presidency. That is a huge deal. So in the event that the president dies, you know, stuff a law. If the vice president dies, stuff a law that person becomes the president of the United States of America. So that is a big deal. So who you vote for and who represents that position could ultimately, in a, an event of a tragedy, be the leader of um, the United States. Um, in addition to that, the House of Rep um, Representatives can review bills um, that pertain to revenue or our budget um, and the economy and money. Um, they can also impeach people, so if there is corruption, they can, you know, draw up articles to get that person out of office. Um, they can um, help elect the president if the Electoral College has a tie. So as we know, the president is elected through the Electoral College, but there also is a popular vote. Um, however, if there is some issue with the Electoral College, um, they can ultimately decide who will be the president. So that's a huge deal. Now, for the Senate, there's 100 senators for, um, that constitute the entire body of the Senate, but again, New Jersey only has two, so definitely we want to know who those two individuals are and get to know them. Now, let's talk about, okay, the leader of the Senate. So, the leader of the Senate is technically the majority leader, as you saw, Chuck Schumer. However, the vice president serves as the president of the Senate. So Vice President Kamala Harris is actually the person who presides over the Senate, although Chuck Sumer is the majority leader. Um, and in the case of ties, where there's like a split 50-50, 
she can be the tie-breaking vote, which is a big deal. And we've seen this happen already when it came to some deadlocks that happened in Congress. So very important. In addition to that, they have the power to confirm the presidential appointment. So if the president wants to appoint a specific person to the Supreme Court, the Senate gets to hear who, and they make that you know, decision. In addition to that, they can um, provide advice when it comes to treaties. So if the you know, United States wants to enter into a treaty with um, foreign countries or you know, what have you, they get to consent to that or give advice as to why they agree or disagree. Um, and additionally, they can um, also engage in impeachment um, cases as well as um, improve um, appointments to the vice presidency. So they also um, have a say in who will eventually be the vice president, which is a huge deal. Gonna take a sip of water. <laughs> Perfect. So now let's get into New Jersey again. Powers of the governor. So does everybody know who the governor of New Jersey is? Raise your hand if you know who the governor is. Okay, that's good, that's good. Fun fact, that was my former boss. Um, prior to working at CARE, I was actually working with his administration. So our governor currently is Philip Dutton Murphy. He is the 56th governor of New Jersey. So prior to him, there was 55 governors. He's 56. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what Governor Murphy has the power to do. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times people, when they think about the governor, you can think about the governor as the president of New Jersey. Um, he's not the president of the United States, um, but he is the executive leader of New Jersey. So he heads our government here in the state. So he's the chief executive. So as governor, um, for those who don't know, we have one of the most powerful um, governor's office in the um, nation. Um, the um, governor has a lot of powers that a lot of other states don't have, um, and that's pursuant to our state constitution. So that's a really important thing to note. Additionally, he oversees the departments, agencies, boards, and commissions that make up the executive branch. So essentially, he's in charge of all the different um, departments in the state. So if you think about it, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, Attorney General's Office, what have you, he is the head of all of those departments, although there are people who are serving as the leaders of those respective departments. So he has a lot of power and control. He signs bills into law in the state of New Jersey. So if you're worried about legislation or you're thinking about different laws, he's the one who has the power of the pen. So eventually, if something comes to his desk, he has the power to sign it. Additionally, like the president, he can call the legislator here um, in New Jersey, the state Senate Assembly, to come to session um, or for a special session if there's something that needs to be done, um, whether it be of a legislative or executive nature. In addition to that, in the state level, he can also grant clemency. So again, if there is a person who has a specific federal, um, my bad, um, if he, uh, they have a specific um, state offense, he can you know, forgive them um, for that crime or forgive them for that offense um, and pardon them or commute their sentence. So if someone's incarcerated, he can essentially say, you know, you're free to go, um, depending again on what that um, offense is. He's also the only person who can call in the National Guard. So as you know, a National Guard is um, uh, an aspect of our um, you know, army, and he has the power and control of the National Guard here in the state. Um, and also he can appoint heads of state um, agencies and judges. Um, so he has a lot of power to you know, create commissions and appoint people to be in head and in charge of those commissions. So like, if there's an issue um, that is important to you or if there's like, you know, positions um, that are open, he has the power to determine who will fill those positions, and that's an important power. Um, so very important to also participate in the elections of the governor because he is the chief executive of the state of New Jersey, and he has a lot of power, um, obviously unlike the president of the United States, but we live in the state of New Jersey, so we definitely are concerned about New Jersey, not just the United States of America. <laughs> now, let's talk about the New Jersey legislature. So we already discussed Congress, which is the US Senate and the House of Representatives. And now let's talk about the New Jersey legislature, which also has two chambers, which is the state Senate. So we don't want to confuse the US Senate with the state Senate, very different. 
um, as well as the General Assembly. So if you want to think about it, um, this would be technically New Jersey's U.S. Senate, and this would be New Jersey's House of Representatives, if you want to think about it in a more, you know, similar way. But again, very different from the federal level. So we have also leadership here in New Jersey. So we have a Senate president and an assembly speaker. So this guy right here is the leader of the Senate in New Jersey, the state Senate. And this is Senate President Nicholas Scutari, and he represents the Legislative District 22. So it's very also important that you know what legislative district that is represented um, because that is where you live um, here in New Jersey. So um, my legislative district is 29. So it's very important to know what your legislative district is because these are the people who represent the district or the place in which you live. Again, we also have leadership for the assembly, and this is Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, who represents the 19th legislative district. So if your home or your school or your misogyn fall into those districts, these are the people who represent you in the Senate and in the assembly, but they are the leaders of um, both chambers, um, respectively. Additionally, we have minority leadership. So essentially, as I stated previously on the federal level, on the state level, the Democrats are both in control of the Senate and the Assembly, so both of those leaders are of the same party. Because the Republicans are the minority in both chambers in the state, they are the minority leaders. So the Republican leader is um, Senator Arjo from Legislative District 24, as well as Assemblyman John DeMeo from Legislative District 23. Again, very important to know those numbers because that depends on where you live. So if you're Legislative District 24, 23, this might be your senator, this might be your assemblyman, so you want to get to know them, also um, as it pertains to the other individuals. Now, when it comes to the entire state um, senate, these are all the state senators. And as you can see, this is the representatives of each district. So this is actually my senator here. Um, and again, that's um, Legislative District 29. Now, when you see a picture like this, you want to be able to look at it and be able to say, okay, I see this number, this is my representative. I know a lot of people are from the Patterson-Wayne area, so they probably are familiar with Senator Poe, um, who is a representative. Um, but it's very important to know not just who represents you, but also your surrounding um, area, your friends, your other family members, because they might not be informed and you could be able to inform them about who their legislator is so they can get in touch and contact with them. So this is the state Senate. <clears throat> Gonna take some water. So <clears throat> this is also another picture. This is their seating chart. So this is exactly how they seat when they're in chamber. So you have the Senate secretary, the president who presides over everything, and the rest of the legislators on the Senate side. <clears throat> Very important to know. Next, this is the state assembly. Now, there's much more assembly people. Um, similarly, on the federal level, there's many more House of Representative members than there are senators. Also on the state level, many more assembly people than there are state senators. And these are all the assembly people, and we all have two assembly people. So it's very important to know who your assembly people are. By looking on this map, I can automatically point to my assembly people. I see one already here. So definitely when you see these charts, you want to know who represents you. You want to get familiar with their names, their faces, um, and get to know them, get in contact with them, call them, um, you know, email them, ask them what their priorities are, ask them about matters that, you know, impact you positively and negatively and very much so be active. For those who don't know, the New Jersey legislature um, is actually going to be having elections soon. And each seat is going to be up for election in 2023. Um, and New Jersey is very unique in the way in which we have elections every year on the state level in this state. So it's, it's very different from um, other states, but it's very important to be active in these um, elections because these are the people who represent you at the most local level um, outside of just, you know, your mayors. They, they represent you on the state level. So they have the control over a lot of policies and laws that happen in the state. So you definitely want to make sure that you're active because these are the laws that are affecting your job, your, you know, community members, your children, so forth. Um, so it's very important to be active. 
And this is more pictures about their seating chart. Again, the speaker presides, the clerk, and then the members. Now let's talk about <clears throat> their powers. They also have respective powers, very different from the governor. So the state senate has 40 members. The general assembly has 80. So double um, is in the assembly, half is in the senate. Um, there are t one senator and two assembly members that are elected from each of the 40 districts in New Jersey. So each of us have one senator and we also have two assembly people. In addition to that, they enact laws. So they can create laws, they create legislation, they create bills. So a lot of the different bills that you see here in New Jersey, for example, advocating for like, you know, the American Muslim Appreciation Month, Muslim Heritage, or the Islamophobia bill, that's the type of legislation that they have the power to create, which is very important and it affects our community. <clears throat> in addition to that, they can propose amendments to the Constitution of New Jersey. So they can change, essentially, the Constitution if they have enough, you know, votes, um, and that's very important. As you know, constitutions matter. We follow the Constitution of the United States, but each state has their respective constitution as well. So very important um, to get to know these people and make sure that they're representing your needs and your interests respectively. In addition to that, the assembly can impeach. Um, they can also, you know, review revenue, so the budget elements of the state. Um, they also, the Senate handles the state budget. Um, and they can also determine meetings. So you can also meet with these individuals. You can call them and ask for virtual meetings, in-person meetings. They are your representatives. You helped elect them. They are beholden to you, the people. So definitely don't be intimidated. Get to know them. Make sure that, you know, you're holding them accountable and they are making sure that they deliver on their campaign promises. And this is more powers. Um, again, they can hold committee hearings. I actually had the um, pleasure of attending a public hearing back in December on the 19th to um, advocate in support of American Muslim Appreciation Month. Um, and um, they also can review legislation and so forth. So definitely um, participate in your state elections as well because they affect you on the um, state level. We also have mayors and city council people, as you know. Um, each of us um, have different um, places in which we live. Um, and there's different types of um, municipalities in New Jersey. Um, essentially, there's 564 municipalities in New Jersey, a lot. Um, and there's over 560 mayors in this state, which is also a lot. Most of us live in municipalities that are either a city. Personally, I'm from Newark, so I live in a city. Some of you live in a town, some of you live in a township, and some of you live in a borough. Um, so it's also important to know which type of municipality you live in because that determines the type of structure that your city council has and the type of structure that your mayor has in terms of their powers. So for example, for cities, the mayor is the chief executive. So the mayor is in control of the city, right? Um, and they participate in council meetings. They can veto ordinances and ordinances can determine like, you know, if your street will have a speed bumps to stop the people from speeding down the, um, you know, street and, you know, possibly hitting someone. Um, you know, they also have city council people um, which are, you know, appointed um, and they also, you know, deliberate when it comes to specific types of um, matters on the um, local level. Um, so this is uh, for those who live in cities, so very important to know which you live in, whether it's a city, a borough, a town, or a township. There's also um, towns, and towns, the, the, the mayor retains all executive responsibilities. However, they also have town councils, and town councils have their respective roles, whether it be, um, you know, um, appointing administrators, whether it be voting on um, local legislation and vetoing or, you know, determining to reject or accept different um, aspects on the municipality level. So it's, it's very important to know if you live in a town and what the powers um, that your town um, individuals have on the local level, as well as townships as well. Um, they have mayors, city council people, um, and they place um, powers that are not had by the mayor and the committee. So very important to get to know your town, township, city, and borough um, individuals as well. And as well as boroughs, they also have a specific structure. Um, and the mayor also has authority, but the, also the council has authority. 
um, and they're able to, you know, appoint administrators and delegate powers in very um, specific ways. So very important to get to know not only your state um, legislators, but also your federal legislators, um, also your local legislators, because these are people who re represent you in various different ways who represent you on the state level, who represent you on the you know, local level, who represent you on the federal level. And all these different aspects of representation affect you in various different ways, but they're all affecting you differently and they're all important. So very important to be involved. So let's talk about the importance of voting and civic engagement. Why should we vote? Again, I know a lot of people are disheartened by the matters of politics and you know everything that goes on in this country. However, as we have learned today, elections have consequences. If you don't vote, you're giving up your right. It is your right to vote. As those who have the ability to vote based off of you know citizenship status um, and specific legal criteria, it's your right. If you don't use it, you're giving away your right. Um, your vote matters, as you see. Um, if you don't um, use it, someone else will, um, and they will elect someone who represents them, um, and that could be at an advantage or a disadvantage to you. So it's very important that you don't give up your voice. Um, as I said, if you don't vote, someone else will, um, and people um, in communities will protect their own interests. So if you don't vote, you also are giving up a vote that will go and protect the interests of your own community. And as one UMA, we are UMA together, and um, if you are not in support um, of, you know, voting, you are essentially, you know, giving up the power that, you know, your community has. It's also an opportunity for change. You can elect people who, you know, align with, you know, your vision of change. Um, and these people create long-lasting implication for decades to come. These are not matters that affect you for one year and then it's, okay, we can think about something else. This is things that will affect you for generations, for your generation, your kids' generation, grandkids, um, you know, so it's very important. And vote to show the strength of the New Jersey Muslim community. We are a very powerful voting bloc and we need to act like it. You know, when we use our voice, as you saw in my last presentation, we show up and we show out and we get into these seats. So it's very important for us to continue to do so if we want representation on all levels. In addition, why participate in civic engagement? It can improve relationships. You can, you know, have community involvement. You increase your knowledge, you learn more. You know, this is an aspect of civic engagement. I'm pretty sure we all learned something today, even myself, <laughs> while I was doing this presentation. You grow, you develop, you know? You have a healthier quality of life. And you have better government because you have people in power who are representing your needs and your values and the needs of your community. Um, so it's so important to be active and to vote. In closing, I want to close with uh, ayah from the Quran. So we all might be familiar with this, you know, verse. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So if you don't change or, you know, you don't seek the change that you want to see in the world, there, there is just no way that that's going to happen. You have to make concerted efforts to do the work to be a part of the progress. Nobody says it better than, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you get the point. Um, in closing, again, this is about our religious duty. So we as Muslims always want to connect it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. So as Muslims, we are called to uplift society by conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verbally through da'wah and through letting our actions speak louder through service. At the heart of both things is sincere concern for the people. Islam conveys the blueprint for Muslims on how we can fulfill our obligation of civic duty, upholding justice and combating oppression. The Prophet Wasallam spent his life in service to others and that service is only further made manifest in Islam. So as his followers, we must kindle that desire in ourselves to be like him and seek to continue his impact on the world around us um, so that people come to know him through us as they came to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through him. The closer we become to the Prophet sallam, in our worship service and affairs, the more deserving we become of the people of um, the Sunnah. 
So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I have one last request. We have a very good brother in the community who is conducting a research study for a civic and political engagement of American Muslim young adults. Um, his name is Brother Muhammad I. Abbasi. He's a uh, master's of public administration um, stu um, um, student um, and Rutgers PhD candidate. And he's doing an American Muslim civic and political engagement um, survey. And it's only going to take 10 minutes. You don't have to do it now. We have a barcode. But I just want to leave this on the screen for those who are interested. And this um, blurb tells you a little bit more about the survey. And if you click the barcode um, and scan it, it will also give you more information. So I just ask you that, you know, you continue to support our members of the UMA um, in ways in which we can help uplift our community and bring our community forward in political and civic matters. Um, so thank you so much, Zakla Kaidan. I hope you learned a lot today. Um, and I look forward to passing it to our good imam um, and hearing more insight about the religious duty to vote. Um, for that very informative presentation. Um, just one comment, I just want to acknowledge the comment that came in. Um, someone said that Senator Menendez is the leader of the Senate of Foreign of the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and this should make our Muslim and Arab communities more vocal uh, about their concerns. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Ustaz Bakar Asaf, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about the um, the religious obligations of voting, so more on a different lens. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. That was a very informative presentation. Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you. I learned a lot. I feel like I'm a little poli sci major now. Um, I actually learned a lot more than I thought I was going to learn. So may Allah reward you. Uh, I have to be a lot more active. Obviously, I thought there was like the president, the mayor, and that was it. We were good. So it was like two elections, and then maybe like Pascal here and there, but you know, anyhow, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala Rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. And like the sister said, any time that we're going to try to understand uh, what our obligation and our duty is in terms of how we interact with society in the form of da'wah, one of the things you have to understand that this topic on how we engage on certain levels is one side of it. How you participate in those levels also is another side of it. Um, I don't think that anyone here would expect to get the full outline of our game plan, if you will, in an hour or in 20, 30 minutes. But one thing I could tell you is that Amja, uh, which many of those uh, scholars I learned directly from, alhamdulillah, they posted in one of their conferences a very, very detailed uh, bath, a research paper on uh, the uh, involvement of Muslims in society, and especially in the United States. And Dr. Salah Hassawi was one of those leaders who published those papers. So I encourage everyone to go on that website, Amja Online, and uh, look up that, uh, that conference, and you'll see those uh, verdicts that they came up with. One of the things that you'll notice is that first, the source by which we go and we determine our involvement is in the Quran. Because Allah just said, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانَ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا He said that he gave every example. If you have a problem in your society, in your life, in your family, and you need a solution, Allah said just go read the Quran. Understand it. Study it. Study it with scholars because this is ilm that you must have. You know, understanding all of this is one thing. Now, who you vote for based on what they're saying they represent you with is another thing. You know, because there was a lot of times that we've seen Muslims voting for, you know, voting for marijuana and legalizing it. This is mind-blowing, right? You say, why? Oh, there's people who are incarcerated for no good reasons. There's, we're not here to sit there. That, that, that is a problem. But when you want to go and engage, you have to engage with ilm. You can't just go there and say, I'm going to be proactive. The first step is learning, and that's the effort. But the problem is most of us want our Islam now on TikTok. And on, uh, it used to be YouTube. Now, Allah Yarham, and that was at least a two-hour video. Now it's like a two-minute video. And, uh, and that's what, you know, I think weekly now, I'm getting messages saying, is this right? Is this wrong? And it's all TikTok, right? And this is not how we learn our religion. 
You want to learn the religion and how you get involved and how we're supposed to, who we're supposed to vote for and how we're supposed to vote. And if we're supposed to vote, that will determine, by the way, you should. I'll just say it right now as a preacher so you start getting nervous, right? But I will say this, that the, we have, alhamdulillah, we're lucky enough that we are blessed with some local scholars. And it's very important that we take advantage of learning from them. Because the Prophet sallallahu he said, al anbiya al he said that the ones who inherited from the NBA were the scholars. And it is the ilm that's going to allow us to make good choices, to vote the right way, to get into certain positions or avoid certain positions. Yeah, there are certain positions we should avoid. And again, all of that is in that detailed paper. But most of the, most by and large, we should be very involved. And if you look in Surah Yasin, Allah mentions about when he sent messengers to a town he sent messengers to a town and how those people reacted to the dawah to understanding this religion you see one of the scholars if you read some of the history of islamic uh, ilm, they said if we're going to live in a non-muslim society meaning what we are away from the jama'ah you have to understand this a lot of people just think like oh i was born in jersey i was i love this state and i mean that some people say oh what about overseas i love overseas too but i love jersey more I don't know how to explain it. So I was born and raised and this is what I know. But one thing I could tell you is something very, very important is how you engage with the people around you, how, in, how you interact. So with, when us living in a non-Muslim society, it is wajib upon us, it is obligatory upon us to give da'wah. It is obligatory upon us to give da'wah. And da'wah, which, which is spreading the message of Islam, comes in many ways. It doesn't only mean to sit on a table on the corner in New York City telling people who Jesus was. That's one aspect of it. May Allah reward them. But there's another aspect. Some of this, some of this work that this, this organization's doing, this masjid is doing, right? And there's a lot of other organizations that we need to be a part of. And you can also be a part of it in many ways. Some of you, mashallah, are very good business people. So support them financially. You can help. They need to run. And so they need, those, they need those resources. So you, everybody's participating in their own way. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is helping with a good deed, they get the reward of it like the other. And there is no diminishing of the other reward. There's no diminishing. So you're all sharing in the same reward. So you all have skills. You all participate in a way that befits you, that you use those skills for the da'wah. So if you're a good business person, be an honest business person, be easy with people, and then share that wealth. With the, with the organizations that need it. By the way, they didn't tell me to say this. They didn't. I'm not on commission. They didn't say 5% about how much you raise. There's no raising here. I'm just letting you know that us as Muslims, we have an obligation to take part in everything. Right? Allah Azza mentioned in Surah Yasin, in Surah Yasin about uh, this man who comes from the farthest part of town to come and support the da'wah. Where Allah says, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلًا, رجل يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قوم اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ That he said that a man came from the farthest part of town. By the way, we could spend one, ay one hour on this ayah, but we're not going to do that. It's Friday night. I know you guys didn't even have dinner yet. I'm between you and food. And don't worry, but what we're going to get to is the understanding, at least from this verse. So this man, he comes from the farthest part of town. For what reason? يَسْعَى He's a rajulun, yes, aqal ya qawm ittabu'ul mursaleen. That he tells the people that you should follow and listen to the message of Islam that these messengers are telling you. Ibn Abbas and a few others who commented in the understanding of this verse. He said this was a man named Habib bin Najjar. By the way, Allah doesn't mention his name. For what reason? Because you will find when Allah says that when Allah says relate to them the stories for what reason? So you can contemplate it. So you can figure out how I apply it in my life. So that this story will apply to you. It will apply to you and it will apply to some other group of people from now to the day of judgment. The Quran doesn't expire. And that's the reason that Allah made the Quran the way He did. That's the reason why? Because it's going to last until the day of judgment. You see, that's why he didn't allow the law of Isa or the law of Musa to last. It was good for their time. When Allah said he's going to make the Quran last till the day of judgment, it's because it's going to be applicable 
to every single time, every single place. And you know who will apply it for us? The scholars. But they're boring. But guess what? You got to put in the effort, folks. You got to put in the effort to learn so that you can go ahead and understand how to apply that ilm with hikmah, with wisdom. So Ibn Abbas said about this man, when they were giving da'wah, they were giving da'wah, the people concocted a plan to kill these messengers. Look how vicious people are. These people are just giving da'wah. They're just speaking about the message of Allah. And yet, they concocted a plan to kill them. They came with no violence, no harm, no nothing. Just want to tell them about Allah. That's it. And so when he heard about their plan, why did they hear about their plan? Some of our teachers, they said because why he was very ingrained in society, this man. This man was very ingrained in society. He was with the people. And by the way, when he comes and he's here to speak on behalf of the messengers because he's a Muslim, they listen to him. So they give him the floor. They know who he is. He's active. This man, Habib al-Najjar. Do you know who else about his characteristic? Ibn Abbas said he was a sickly man and he had, he was like handicapped. He had leprosy. May Allah Azza protect us in health and in man. Not just that. He was also a businessman. He was a rope merchant. And not just that, he used to donate 50% of his wealth to charity. He says, wow, mashallah. So I, I can't do that. Don't worry, you don't have to. The Prophet put a maximum. He said one third. That's what you guys do. We can't even get to one third. Don't worry. But what we're saying is look at the excuses we come up with. One, he is sick. Little handicap. Leprosy is a sickly skin disease where they're very, people have an aversion of looking at them. May Allah Azza heal those people with such a disease. And may Allah Azza allow us to find a cure for that disease if there, if there isn't one. Nonetheless, so he's sick, handicapped. He has a disease. He's a businessman. And he's still giving da'wah. And the scholars also mention why Allah mentioned Rajul. Why Allah mentioned Rajul in this verse? Because it is obligatory upon this side of the group to give da'wah. And yet, Look how the shaitan played us. Look how the shaitan played us in this country. By the way, that doesn't mean that the sisters, you don't do da'wah. That doesn't mean that. I just want to make sure you know, mashallah, may Allah reward her. But that means the obligation is on that side. But you know what's going on now? That side's doing all the da'wah. You know what we do? We grow a beard, but that's in style now. We lift the pants up. That's a style now. It's in style. You're retro. That's the thing. You see, what you have to understand is If the shaitan can't get you to stop doing something good He's going to get you to stop, ch to change your intention You see, this is grow beer, this is now it's cool You're doing it because it's cool, you're doing it because it's sinna of the Prophet Which one are you doing it for? The most beloved, we were talking about this in the khutbah this morning The most beloved garment to the Prophet was the kameez, the long shirt we Talked about this last time, right? Shaitan makes a fool out of us Makes a fool out of us. The one garment that the brothers can't seem to get long enough is the shirt. Now we invented a new move in salah. We got to hold it down when we're making ruku'. You guys don't see that. We see cracks and smiles all day and it's messing our salah up. But what's going on is because no ilm. That's what's happening. And yet here Allah is just saying what? That it's up to us as a communal effort. Because the Rasul said, and they sat. And they sat on shiqaq and ar rijal That the women are like the other halves of men. What applies to men applies for women. Unless we have an exception for it. Here we don't have one. So it's obligatory upon you. And yet, these sisters who put this headscarf on, they can't run away. They can't run away from that Muslim identity. And they're giving da'wah more than we are. So may Allah reward them tremendously. And I mean that. When you see the effort that they're doing, it's not easy. The shaitan used them as his path to leading people astray a long time. Not them, not you particularly, but that was his plan. Women, drugs, alcohol, and music. That was it. Look at the time of sheath and you'll see he just kept on repeating it, which is different songs. That's what happened. And different women. And now they put them with a car or something like that. It's weird. But that's it. That's his plan. Dumb plan. And yet here, Allah is just saying is that this man, he comes from the farthest part of town to give da'wah. And so you have to understand a few other things as well. The speech to his people is he says, Ya qawmi. Wow. He says, Ya qawmi. You know, I went to a fundraiser one time. They were raising money for a masjid. I went to one of the brothers on the board. I said, why are you building this masjid? He said, brother, to protect the children from the fitna. 
I said, mashallah, what fitna? He said, the fitna that's out there. So we got to build the message so they come in here. I said, so let me understand. The fitna that's out there, what's the goal here? We get them in the masjid, we lock them in, and we just don't get them out till it's time for sleep? What fitna are we talking about? Is this the Islam that the Prophet ﷺ told us to implement? You see? Even some a cause as good as building a masjid, we're doing it for the wrong reason. We're doing it for the wrong reason. Ya qawmi, he's saying, oh my people, these kuffar, these non-believers who are about to kill the, the messengers of Allah, he's telling them, oh my people. Because guess what? This is our people. Do you understand that? New Jersey is our people. Clifton is our people. This is our qawm. This is who you belong to. You know, I'll tell you, if you still sit there and you attribute yourself to your roots back home, go back home. They look at you like you're a foreigner. They look at you like you're foreign. Sure, that's your ethnicity, that's your background. You should be proud and hamla and represent. No problem. But you're from here. You have to understand that. And you have to be part of it. And you have to want the change. You won't have to want positive change. Not sit there and tell me, yeah, alhamdulillah, we got same-sex marriage going on. He says, what? He says, yeah, it was a minority law. We, we were minorities. We're going to go with that. It's just mind-blowing. We don't understand what's going on. Just so you know, I am a failed fifth five-time candidate for president. I wrote myself in. Yeah. You see, one thing I'm going to tell you, and I tell this to all my halqa, it is required for you to vote. It is required for you to vote. Every single time. Every single election. There was a lot more now that I know I got to get involved in. I didn't know about all this. And I got like nine more, thanks to you, sister. Thank you. May Allah Azza reward you. So I got a lot more work to do. I really did think it was just three or four. But nonetheless, here we go. All right. And if, and if it's somebody you disagree with on both sides, we're also not fools. Maybe you don't want to vote for a sleeping president. Maybe you don't want to vote for a racist. So you, wrote, you write yourself in. Write Sheikh Qatnani. I don't care. You write somebody in and you still participate. You know there are questions at the end of those, uh, 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 at the end of the voting booth that are more important possibly than the, the candidate that's running. They happen. Even in local elections. Tell you how they're going to use the tax money, how the, what, what laws they're going to implement. Now we got like 50 identities going on. You know, I mentioned that last time, right? Supposed to be men and women. Then they confused all of us. All sorts of stuff going on. I don't need to get into that. But my point is, is that you understand there is a communal obligation for us to be involved. Because our qawm, as Allah referred to here, between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, this is a communal thing. This is our effort because these are our people. You have to look at your neighbor as part of your people. Not just like, oh, I got to give them da'wah sometime. I got to shovel the snow. It's, Alhamdulillah, Muslim shoveled my slow snow. He took out my garbage. Oh, Alhamdulillah, Muslim took out my garbage. Are you proud of that? That's, that's your effort for the week? That's what you did? You got a lot more ways to go. But I'm telling you, it has to start with knowledge. Look at this. We learned all of this, but there's also an Islamic knowledge that we have to understand and how we get involved. And then just on a few things, if you are, if you read the rest of this story, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you'll notice that he gives da'wah in a very specific way. He's very inclusive in everything he says. Everything he says. He says, you versus me. I don't agree with you. He says, we. He uses the word we a lot. So when you're going to address these politicians, he says, you know, when I, when I saw Grabowski, you know, that's the new mayor of Clifton, right? Okay. When I saw him in the pizza store, I said, the new mayor. He said, yeah. I said, do good for us. Whatever that equals, do good. He said, I appreciate that. I said, no problem. And this person, you just have to give them words of encouragement. Because he, the things and the changes and the laws, like she mentioned, he's going to make, is going to affect all of us. You have to understand that. You have to be involved. And I ask Elijah that he allows us to be involved. And you have to understand one last thing, that when you are involved, you have to go with your family, not just you. Remind your wife, remind your children who are 18 years old, 18 years of age. You should, you should make it a, a, like a little event. That, hey, now you're, you're lucky, you, you, get to re, you get to register to vote, you get to do all this. You have to show them on how to be involved. Again, I'm not telling you you have to vote for somebody's name that's on that, on that uh, you know, voting sheet. I'm not telling you to do that on that ballot. What I'm telling you to do is do your research, understand what they represent, what they're saying, and if this pertains to us Islamically, or we should stay away from such a thing. And we should write them letters and be involved. This is not too hard, by the way, for any one of you to go speak at these assemblies. It's not hard at all. 
You just request it. We just do it in college all the time. All the time. Yeah, it's a drive. Trenton down there seems like it's forever. But you got to get there. Again, there's effort that needs to be made. Make a little fun trip out of it. Go with the group. Tell them why can't we do certain things. Well, lie, there's so many things that we should be involved in that, they're in that they're forcing our children to learn about. It's madness. And it can be changed if we see the society as our home. But unfortunately, what I've seen with a lot of Muslims, they have a different solution. We learn to isolate ourselves. How? We build our masajid, then we ra raise our voices in our hands to the masjid boy says, oh, we need a community center. Then we build a community center, and then we need the best private schools, and we put them in their own schools. And then by the time they get to college, boom, philosophy hits them, and then they're lost. They don't know what happened. This is, they're confused. And then they don't know what, what on earth they're doing here. Then they wind up leaving Islam, some of them. Why? Because they were never exposed to the society around them. They were in a bubble. They were harnessed. And so us, we have to be involved with the community like Allah has mentioned. And again, continue reading that story on your own because I don't want to keep you too long tonight. But if you have questions, you know, you can bring them up. And in a very detailed matter, of if you're somebody who's interested in politics or running for one of these positions, you could go on that research paper that was compiled by the, the Legendless uh, Committee in Amgen. You could read it. It's very, very detailed. Uh, and, and you'll be able to see where you fit and uh, where you should poss possibly uh, stay away from. But nonetheless, on all levels in voting and participating in society, it is highly recommended. And by the way, the scholars never differentiated whether it was for the president or the, the state or your city council, all of them are equally highly recommended that we should be involved in, in participating in. And I ask Allah that he allows us to make choices that are, that are in line with what pleases him. And I ask Allah that he allows us to avoid making decisions that are, what, uh, that are things that displease him. And I ask, him, I ask Allah that he allows us to always learn this religion and make decisions that are beneficial. اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وينفعنا ما علمتنا يا رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وصلى على محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين جزاك الله خير أستاذ بكر We have one question I'm going to put both of you on the, on the spot on this How many Muslims are there in New Jersey? Back on. That is a really good question. So technically, when it comes to the national percentage, there is about 1.3% of Muslims nationally. However, New Jersey has a larger percentage um, per, per capita um, compared to the national average. So I believe New Jersey has a 3% percentage um, of Muslims. So we actually have the most Muslim representation in the nation. Now, the actual number, roughly, I think, 400,000. Um, so, still very large number, um, and we're leading the charge in representation um, on, a, on a, a statewide level and on a national level. So, we're doing pretty good with um, our numbers here. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Um, one person had a question in terms of what's the distinction between a city and a town, and I think you also said there's also a borough. Yes. Yeah. So that's a good question. So it really just depends on the structure. So like, for example, Newark. Newark is the biggest city in New Jersey, as you all know. Um, and Newark is very different from, like, say, for instance, Prospect Park, which is a borough. Um, so they both still have mayors. They have different population sizes. And the specific powers that the mayor has differs um, based off of the structure in the which the borough um, has been set up and the structure in which the city has been set up. They also both have councils, but the council powers are very unique to the specific um, elements of the borough um, as it uh, pertains to the specific elements of um, the city. So they all still have um, local representation, but the way in which that representation is, um, um, the way that representation is differs. So it is a good question. And I'm very happy to put the um, slide back on if anybody wants to see it again or disseminate the materials um, just for um, more purposes.
but, but each one would still have an, a mayor, like a city, and yes. a, that, the, regardless of what it's called or the structure, yes. each one would have a mayor. And there's okay. over 560 mayors um, in the state um, and over 564 um, municipalities. Okay. Um, and then the, another question in regards to your presentation was, if you could talk a little bit about county politics and board of educations, like where does board of educations fit into um, the, the different kind of branches that you talked about at, at the state level? That's a good question. Um, as you probably all know, I believe East Brunswick just had a school board meeting um, a few days ago regarding the Eid holiday. My colleague um, uh, Zaid, who's in the audience, was actually at that board meeting and a lot of members of the community were there. So Board of Education um, roles are actually very important as well. So within the state of New Jersey, we have the Department of Education and then we also have school boards. So the Department of Education oversees the school boards um, and they oversee um, the education within the state of New Jersey. However, because New Jersey has so many different municipalities, each municipality has their respective school boards that um, deal with the specific elements of how education is instituted in that specific area. So it is important to run for school boards because school boards determine, you know, if specific holidays will be in instituted in that specific school district, what type of curriculum will get to get, you know, instituted in that um, school district. So it is important if there are vacancies in your, um, you know, municipality for school board, um, positions you run because they have a lot of power and control over those elements that affect their children um, and that ultimately just affect the community because the children are the future. Um, and then the second question was... Uh, I think it was, it was mainly focused on like what's, like how, where is the Board of Education fit, which okay. I think you and kind of... Ex like the then, counties. And, and county politics, yeah, yes. that's the other question. And county politics are also very important as well. So as you know, um, within counties, each county or like specific counties have like freeholders. They also have like, you know, county um, executives. For example, again, I'm going to use um, my, um, my, t my city as an example. So Excess County has, um, you know, Joe D. Everybody probably knows who Joe D. is in Excess County. Um, he's one of the county um, executives. And the county executives, they have a lot of control and power over elements that happen on the county level. So, like, you know, for example, um, they do have the ability to interface with the mayor. They have the ability to interface with the governor a lot of times. They have the ability to interface with, you know, state legislators, um, and they help get specific elements done on the county level. So when it comes to like, you know, roads, when it comes to specific, you know, capital projects. So all matters um, on the political spectrum are important, whether it's at the most local level, um, like, you know, the school board district, all the way up to the federal delegation of the presidency of the United States of America. Each of these people and each of these respective roles affect us in very unique ways. So we want to make sure that we are involved as much as possible because you don't want to necessarily say like, oh, I'm only going to vote for president. And that's nice, vote for president. But you also want to vote for your school board district person too who is affecting the curriculum that's taught to your children that's um determining whether your kid can get off for eid or whether they have to catch up for schoolwork if they don't get off for eid so we have to be mindful that um politics and you know elections are the long game it's it's, it's a marathon it's not a sprint it's not just you know i'm concerned this year and i'm going to take off and not be concerned next year because again the implications impact us for decades to come in various different ways. So very good question. Thank you. Zakalakh Khair. Well this concludes uh today's uh lecture. Zakalakh everyone for Zakumakh everyone for uh attending. Hopefully inshallah everyone uh found this um discussion uh beneficial and inshallah we'll see everyone uh, next week. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum everyone